afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Harnessing Technology for Social Good lecture series. I am thrilled um, to, uh, to bring, I guess, um, Lisa Mercer um, to the tech series. Uh, Lisa is an assistant professor in the School of Art and Design here at the University uh, of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to this, she received her MFA from the University of North Texas, where she did a very interesting uh, two-year ethnographic study um, on um, developing uh, kind of an app uh, to detect or report human trafficking um, called Operation Compass. And she is here today to tell us um, about that study and her work. Um, so her talk today is on social impact and social design. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at her CV and also looking through her materials, um, I truly believe that she is a social activist at heart. And so I'm really thrilled um, that she agreed to come and talk with us. Well, thank so you. So thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Judy. I'm, I'm so excited to be here. I, we were talking before, I was actually raised by a social worker. So I have great admiration for the work that you do. My mom was a social worker in the 80s and 90s during the AIDS, working with AIDS patients. And really at that time, they didn't know what it was. So it was a really interesting time, I think, for her to be working there. And she's also now working in Tucson, Arizona with graduate students, and she recently won the Apple Award. So wow. it's wonderful to see her and what she does. Um, but I would like to start off with just acknowledging the land that we're on. So I'm going to read you this paragraph. We would like to begin today by recognizing and acknowledging that we are on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskakia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Muskudin, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw Nations. These lands were the traditional territories of these native nations prior to their forced removal. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. So now that I've given you a little bit of context of where we are, I'd like to give you a context about who I am. I graduated from Purdue University in 2000 with a degree in graphic design, and I had a very smart advisor who recommended that I take HTML. And I graduated in 2000 really when like, the internet was just so popular and like, really booming. And so I started to work in graphic design or in inter interaction design. And so I worked in industry developing websites, both external for consumers and internal for um, employees with AT&T, Georgia Pacific, Kraft, and then also developing mobile apps. So when I went back to get my master's degree, I had to start thinking about what I was going to do for my thesis. And it, I saw a wall very similar to this one at the University of North Texas. And it was a student group that was talking about human trafficking. And I was really naive to what human trafficking was. I knew very little about it. And so I thought, with my interaction background, I thought, I'm going to create this app that allows victims of human trafficking to download it, push a button, and then you know, it would just like be a call for help, and law enforcement would sort of swoop in and save the day. So if you know anything about human trafficking, you know that's a very naive perspective. And so I had some very smart advisors who recommended that I do the right thing and do research to make sure I really understand the type of technology I was creating and who I was creating it for. So the first question I asked was, how can technology help people in human trafficking? And I really was asking the wrong question at this point. But it was through my research of learning about human trafficking that helped me get to the right question, which I'll show you here in a couple slides. Um, but I want to read to you the definition that I use for human trafficking in my study. It comes from the United Nations in 2003, and it's the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring, or receipt of persons by means of threat or use of force or other forms of coercion, of abduction, of fraud, of deception, of the abuse of power or a position of vulnerability or the giving or receiving of payments or benefits to achieve the consent of a person having control over another person. So what I've done here is I use some of the words that, that you may have heard me say here in the definition, and I tried to create a visual of it so you can understand what this means exactly and the different words that are often used to explain human trafficking. So I often hear, well, is that the same thing as modern day slavery? Is that the same thing as trafficking in persons? And what is human trafficking? Like it's not always the movement of people. So I think it's really important to understand the definition and all of the ways that you can define that. There are 21 million people estimated to be in human trafficking, um, victims of human trafficking globally. Um, and 
I say I hesitate to even ever give numbers on human trafficking because there is no accurate collection in human trafficking. And so I will speak to that a little bit more in my research. But in the United States, the estimation number is 300,000. The University of Texas in Austin, the School of Social Work, actually did a, a data research on historical data. And they estimated that 80,000 um, children in the state of Texas alone were victims of human trafficking. So that kind of blows out of the waters the project, projection that Polaris had at a national level. So back to this idea of like me not really understanding the mindset of a victim of human trafficking. And so what I needed to understand was that the, if they didn't often identify as being a victim of human trafficking, then what would prompt them to then download an app and ask for help? And so what I, I learned by speaking to as many social service providers and victims advocates that would talk to me is that they didn't often identify as such because they were often recruited at such a young age. So the average age for recruitment is between the age of 11 and 13. Um, the estimation for boys is actually a little lower than for girls. However, I think that's changed in the past two years. And so often when they turn 18, they don't, they don't it, they're in the, it's in the mindset that this is what they're good at, this is what I'm capable of, and so they stay in that life. And they often see um, the people around them as a, way of, as a source of family. And so they stay, and there's also a, a fear of law enforcement and so many other peripheral factors that keep them in this lifestyle. So what I learned was that not everyone see, saw themselves as a victim. One of the partnerships I have is with Mosaic Family Services in Dallas, and Bill Bernstein is the head of their human trafficking side. And one of the, one of the stories that he, he tells that I think is really telling about this mindset is there was a woman, she was foreign national, and she was working as, um, at a, a corporate position, someone that you would have never known was being trafficked, as are most victims. Um, and she, she was never receiving payments. She had worked at this position for about seven or eight years. And once they informed her, you know, it's your right in the United States to earn the wage that you're, that you're um, working for. And she started to understand you know, what she was um, allowed to by based off of the work that she was providing this, this customer, or this, uh, this, cor this corporation, that she was a victim of human trafficking. And so then, only then she was able to ask for services and they were able to provide her the help that she needed. So at this point, I really started to look at the most common places that human trafficking was likely to occur. So the national um, hotline received about 33,000 phone calls in 2013, and only 300 of them identified as truck drivers. And I wondered what the discrepancy was, given that it was one of the top 10 locations for you to witness human trafficking. So that's when I started to narrow in on truck drivers. And I also changed my question. So my question ended up being for my thesis, how could a modified form of technology enable truck drivers to report suspected cases of human trafficking at a higher rate? So the first place that I went was truck driver training school, because I didn't even know a truck driver when I decided to work with truck drivers. I knew nothing about their lifestyle, the technology they used, how they used it, why they used it. And so I went to, um, I, I would just call, I mean, I would call anyone who was willing to talk to me. And I called a, a director to a driving range, or to a driving school. And he was like, come in. And he, we, I went in, he spent, I think, around an hour and a half with me to two hours. And he was really excited about the idea of incorporating the education of human trafficking and how to identify it with their truck drivers. And so he invited me to go down to their driving range, is what you see here. And on their driving range, they are teaching truck drivers how to drive the rig, how to use the technology. And the drivers that you see here have about 50 years of experience between them. So when I got to the driving range, um, the director had already called down and told them, there's Lisa Mercer's coming. She's going to talk to the, the students and the, the um, educators, just let her on the driving range. So he said, I know why you're here. Go ahead and go out there. And I said, OK, great. Can I take pictures? No problem. Take as many pictures as you want. So I was out there for about 20 minutes. And I was hearing some wonderful anecdotal stories about how they live their lives that was really helping me inform some decisions about the technology they could potentially use. And I got into this orange rig that you see there on the left. And the director of the driving range came out, the same gentleman who was like, go ahead, do whatever you need to do. And he asked me to get out of the rig. And I tell this story because I think it's really important for students to learn um, through myself 
uh, in my own mistakes and research. Even after having an IRB, after making sure I did everything I need to do to make sure I was um, hitting all of the ethical points in my research, I made a huge mistake by not speaking to that, that director of the driving range and letting him know why I was there. So he pulled me out of the, the rig and said I, I needed to leave. And so I, I then explained to him, you know, the reason I'm here is not because I believe human trafficking is happening on the driving range. It's because I need to know how truck drivers live their lives so I can actually create a piece of technology that they themselves find useful, beneficial, that, that they feel like they have some sort of input on. And then it would also help with buy-in, right? So once I explained that to him, um, by then all the students and these two gentlemen had surrounded us, so we had everyone's attention. And it was great because then we stood there for about an hour and I learned about the vernacular they used. I learned about which driving ranges or um, travel stops I should avoid in the Dallas-Fort Worth areas, which one um, I should go to, the type of people that I should look for and what they would be dressed like. Um, and so it really helped me inform like where I went for my observations at travel stops. So the next stop is, this is one of the travel stops that they actually encouraged me to go to because they knew there was human trafficking here, but it wasn't as dangerous as some of the travel stops in South Dallas. They told, they told me which travel stops not to go to um, without, without somebody else with me. So this travel stop I would go to, and my husband and I would spend every, like a few Friday nights, I'd say, I'd say about five or six Friday nights eating pie with truck drivers. So I went in there and I talked to the restaurant manager and I said, this is what I'm doing. This is what I need to learn from truck drivers. And I'd love to just buy truck drivers pie and see if we can just talk. And I wasn't even thinking that we were gonna talk about X, Y, Z. I just needed to learn from them how they live their lives. So we would go and we went every Friday night, like I said, to this travel station. There's about, this travel stop can accommodate 200 truck trucks. And um, as you can see, it has a lot of different accommodations. So the place that we would spend most of our time was in number one. And here are some pictures from that travel location as well. So we were in the iron skillet and there was actually a spot in the iron skillet that was specifically for truck drivers. And because they knew who we were and we became sort of regular, so to speak, um, we would always just sit in the truck driver's spot and we would eat pie with them and I would talk to them and I would hear some great stories from them about the technology they use, why they use it, what they were doing, what their fears were as truck drivers. Um, and a lot of them were excited about the idea of having a community that could then fight against human trafficking because it was something that they were seeing a lot of and they didn't know how to take the next steps. With that said, I, I also heard a lot from other truck drivers you know, they're out there making a living and just like I am, so why do, you know, can I just partake in it? So, while well, I did hear both sides of the coin, I do like to mention. So some of the vernacular that I heard and the most common words that they used to refer to sex workers at truck stops was this list here, but the most common one was lot lizard. I had never heard this term before working with truck drivers. And what I found really interesting was that you could even buy stickers like like you know the red circles with the X through it, so you would, it would say like no, and it was a picture of somebody had animated of a lot lizard. So they would put that on the side of their rigs, so that way it would, it would say essentially no sex workers. And then you could also buy these. And I was pretty upset, I was pretty mad about these, I'll be honest. So I actually ended up calling this company and I said, do you know what you're selling? And they just didn't care at all. They were absolutely fine with not knowing and, and partaking in the culture. Um, what I also learned in talking with all these truck drivers was the different type of technology they used. So it really helped me start to eliminate which ones made the most sense based off of other conversations we were having. One thing I learned was that anonymity was really important to truck drivers for various different reasons. So some of these would not accommodate that, and I'm gonna run through those. So what, they would, what truck drivers would often do is send me pictures of their rigs and how they lived. So this is one picture. So in it, you'll see up at the top is Citizens Band Radio, which is the technology often most associated with truck drivers. And then you have the square one right in the middle, which is the Garmin GPS. You have this one right here, which is the Qualcomm. It's an onboarding computer, and most of the companies would give this to the truck drivers, and they use it to kind of manage their time and see how long the drivers are driving for and um, how long they're not. So. I wanna go through the CB first. The Citizens Band and Radio, like I said before, is most often associated with truck drivers. 
And most of them now don't like to even have it on because there are so many solicitations on the CV that they prefer to keep it off. Um, most truck, truck drivers said they only turned it on with like inclement weather or if there's an accident, like a traffic jam of some sort, so they could speak to those around them. So, and I knew that this would not be an ideal technology to report suspected cases. Um, then we went to the Qualcomm, which I showed you a minute ago, and a lot of them felt like Big Brother was watching them, so they would often turn this off. Because what I heard was that when they received the load that they would have to get from point A to point B, they knew they would have to break some of those time restrictions that they had, so they would turn these off, get the load from point A to point B, turn it back on, and then manually input the information that they needed to put input. And it also didn't allow them to remain anonymous. So I didn't want um, to allow the reporting device to be in here. And then this is the Garmin. This is a, just a GPS system. So there's really no way of inputting anything else besides location that they're going to. So I spoke to a driver who said he loves apps. He was so excited to talk to me. He's like, I've been waiting to talk to you because I wanted to talk to you about apps. Which I like talking about apps too because that's, I, mean, I create them. So I was really excited that he was so excited to tell me about all the different apps he used. So he sent me um, a screenshot of all the apps he used. So there's three professional driving programs. Hi. There's three professional driving programs um, for truck drivers. It's with Pilot, Petro, and Love. And they can earn one point to spend at these travel stations um, for every dollar they spend on diesel. And if the company that they're working with is, is um, in collaboration with one of these professional driving programs, they can earn two points per dollar they spend on diesel. And this is really, this is a lot of money. So you can go to those travel stations that I showed you a minute ago, and you can get um, showers, you can watch TV or, or watch a movie, you can get food, get accessories for your rig. So there were, you, there were very applicable reasons to then apply these points that you're <coughs> receiving. Another idea that they liked for using these was that it allowed them to secure a safe place to park. And so um, one of the biggest concerns for truck drivers was cargo theft. And a lot of stories I heard were of um, people who were partaking in some, a sex worker and then the cargo was being stolen from them during the act. So um, that was a huge concern of cargo theft. So I knew, while I did see great value in implementing an, a tracking or a, a way of reporting suspected cases through the, one of these apps, it still didn't allow them to be anonymous. And a lot of times I was hear, hearing that that was one of their biggest fears. Because when a truck driver goes to park at one of these travel stations, they have to give often their own home address they have to give a home address, their driver's license or commercial driver's license. And so it would stop them because they were um, in fear of retaliation. Um, so I'd like to show you some quotes. So one of the drivers that I spoke with said that in his experience, and this particular driver had over 25 years of experience, um, he didn't always know what to do because if he allowed them in to like have like a, a safe place even for a couple moments, um, and then he would call the police to help make sure that the, the sex worker had the services she needed. Um, that the sex worker would often turn on them. The victim of human trafficking would see the trafficker nearby once the police were there, and she would turn on them. So they were afraid of reporting. So, um, so I, I needed to provide them with a way to, to report it without fear of retaliation. And another limitation of my work was the, the um, identifying of human trafficking in itself. I often heard from truck drivers, well, what does it look like? How do I know the difference between a sex worker and a victim of human trafficking? And so um, trying to remain objective in these interviews was really difficult because um, I had you know, ideas of what they should be looking for. But I myself, was, is not, I'm not a victim's advocate. I'm not somebody who works with social with um, victims of human trafficking, and I didn't feel like I had those qualifications yet. So what I would tell them at the end of the interview was that most are recruited between such young ages and that they stay in that life because they don't know a way out. And so I would see like a difference in their eyes and the way that they, then they would, we would start a dialogue based off of you know, how to further identify victims of human trafficking. So it really did become a limitation of my, of my research, but something that I, I start to address later on. 
And I also heard uh, many anecdotal stories about um, a survivor of, or a victim of human trafficking. Um, I heard a woman um, from Emily's house in Washington, D. speak about uh, victims of human trafficking and survivors of human trafficking. And she herself is a survivor of human trafficking. And so I often flip. I think it's, it's good to acknowledge what I'm doing here. I often flip between saying a survivor and a victim of human trafficking because she said um, something that I thought was really poignant. She said that women who are um, victims of human trafficking are surviving every day. So they really are survivors of human trafficking at any point. So, um, so if you hear me flip, it's because I'm often hearing her you know, in, in the vernacular that I myself should use. And this, um, I include this, this quote because it, it just speaks to the theme that I was hearing, not just from the truck drivers at the driving range, but the truck drivers at the truck stops. And the truck drivers that I would reach out to on Twitter, which I always tell you know, everyone, don't meet anyone in person that you're talking to on Twitter, but I myself was doing it because I really needed to talk to truck drivers and I really wanted to get their input. And so I was hearing this, this was a theme that I heard over and over again. And not just the truck stops in South Dallas, but there were trucking routes that everyone knew of. I mean, there were men who told me about truck stops that you literally couldn't take a step without stepping on a condom. So it was so common, commonly known which truck routes to avoid if you didn't want to be around it, or which truck, truck stops to go to if you, if you wanted to. So what you see here is the first prototype of Operation Compass. And these are the factors that really helped me inform some of the design decisions that I made. Um, so anonymity, like I've said over and over again, it needed to be convenient and it needed to be safe. I spoke with a lot of women truck drivers. There's a women truck driving organization. And I had an interview with them. And they told me about, um, they, they created CHAPSTICK with a national human trafficking hotline number on it. And they were so afraid themselves of physical alterations to get out of their rigs that they never handed out the chapsticks. So what they ended up doing was leaving them in the women's restroom just lined up so women could take them. But they can't tell you how successful it was because they themselves were so afraid of leaving the rigs at night. So I took this prototype to a Freedom Network conference. Um, Freedom Network is a human trafficking conference to, um, which Bill Bernstein was one of the co-founders of. And I went there to speak to victims advocates, law enforcement, um, social, social workers, service providers to see the information that I'm collecting in this app, is it even useful? Is it helpful? Does it lead them to help people? Or is, am I actually doing a disservice in some way? And so I needed to understand what that was. So the first thing that they asked me to remove was the photo. And the reason they said that was because I can't guarantee that for pornography reasons, that the pictures they take aren't gonna be saved on their phone and then they themselves won't be incriminated of some sort um, because of pornography laws. So I removed that and then the second most common thing I heard was a policy statement and making sure that it was available in different languages. So right now the app is available in Spanish, um, but I'm hoping to add langu and more languages to that. So this is the app as you see it right now. There's a national app, which is Operation Compass, and then the Operation Compass North Texas app. So you can choose between English and Spanish. And as you can see here, actually I'll go back one, Mosaic Family Services, I've, I've spoken about them a bit. Um, they're still, we're still partners, and they help me receive all of the suspected cases in, on the Operation Compass North Texas app. Um, if I receive a national, like one in from the national and I don't know what to do with it, um, they will also help me with that. They're, they're willing to help me with anything that I receive in. And I've received them as far as Anchorage, Alaska, and Brazil. Um, so you can either report an incident, and this is the 214 number, it's like the, eight, it's the hotline for Mosaic Family Services, and they speak up to 24 different languages. It immediately populates with the date, time, and location. And the reason I included make a recording, because if you remember, they were talking about hearing so many solicitations on the CB radio. And so everyone was very excited about this for different reasons. So I had service providers who were excited about this because they felt like victims of human trafficking could record, make a recording of a situation they were in and submit it for safekeeping. Um, there's an, an area to speak specifically to the victims that they're witnessing. If there's a vehicle involved, and then of any personal information. So as I said before, anonymity was very important. So you can, you can choose not to participate. 
And so of all of the suspected cases that we received so far, <coughs> um, only two have chosen to include their names. So this is the app that is available right now on the Apple App Store and on Google Play. And as I said before, one of the limitations of my research was the education of truck drivers. So what I started to do was partner with social service providers in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and we would invite certain people, like certain um, segments of the population. So not only truck drivers, but now we were looking at plumbers, restaurant inspectors, meter readers, people who had an opportunity to see really behind the scenes that you and I just don't see every day. You know, we're in the same spaces. Like I might go get a sandwich, but I'm not in, like, in the back. And so we need to provide support to people like ADT, um, pizza delivery, um, who have a chance to see in these spaces that we don't see. And if we can help educate them to what human trafficking looks like, then we can help um, receive those suspected cases. So what I started to do, um, you have to remember I'm still a designer, so I decided to take some of the quotes that I was receiving and visualize them. And so this is actually something I'm hoping to do with undergraduates next semester, is taking some of these stories that I'm hearing and help visualize them. And this poster is really meant to be sort of a sucker punch with the, with the quote that I'm giving you, because it looks sort of like an idyllic sunny day with the blue skies. And I really feel like um, with this quote here, it is sort of like a sucker punch, because you can walk by a victim of human trafficking and not even know they're a victim. And so I think that happens to all of us every day. Um, and so the, it was, it was intend, intended to be, to be that. So the next thing that I'm doing, um, as I mentioned before, is trying to collect accurate data in human trafficking. And so it's my belief that these long-term interdisciplinary partnerships is where we can see great value in creating um, design interventions that can really benefit the community that we're working with. So one of the things that I've been doing, I, I was invited to participate in the North Texas Coalition Against Human Trafficking, and I'm the chair of their data committee. And so one of the things that I do is I help them collect their data, and then I help them visualize it. Because often what happens with this data is it's kept in a cardboard box in an, a, you know, like a spare office. And the, the power of that data can help them in more ways than just getting funding, even though I see great value in getting funding, and I know service providers do as well. Um, so what I started to do was develop a database that it will allow us to formulate, to start to formula, formulate accurate data in human trafficking. And so based off of my work with the service providers, victims advocates, law enforcement, and um, one these wonderful people that I was so honored to sit next to in this coalition, is, is I took everything that I was hearing. You know, I heard that they kept the number of beds that are available in the Dallas-Fort Worth area on a Google Doc. And I was like, we can do better than a Google Doc. You know, like with my, with my experience in creating technology, like I know I can do better than a Google Doc. And so then I thought, okay, well, what else do you need help with? And really, it was just that one service provider wasn't providing all the services to one victim. They often work together to provide those services. So then how do you share that personal information? So we need a HIPAA and FERPA safe hosting um, platform, so that way they can provide um, this database um, and share this information on, on an online platform, and like, almost like a safe house, so to speak, sort of database. So um, the people that I was working with, um, which I already mentioned, so I'm going to skip over this one, um, and who they serve. So um, it was really important to collect, to not only collect accurate data, but then to contextualize that data. Um, not to get too much into data science, but it's really important when you're collecting data not just to use percentages, but to provide context to those percentages. So we can really understand how we can have an impact um, in certain areas. So this, this collection here, this information, was meant to provide context to the data we were collecting. Um, and I was also working with them to figure out, like, how are they doing community outreach, and how could that then further contextualize that data? I'm going to skip over these. I apologize. Um, so the first thing I did was to start creating a database. I was still in the Dallas-Fort Worth area when I initially started working with this. And I was working with the Dallas PD at this point and the vice unit. And there was one gentleman, Sergeant um, Nunez, who was really, um, he had a personal connection to human trafficking. 
And so it was really important to him to be as incorporated into the solution as I felt like I wanted to be. And so to him, to see something like this, he said, I can use this information and take it into a judge and say, I need to shut down this hotel. So that way I can actually go in there and do my, um, my, my research. I can find out what's going on. And I can make sure that the people who are involved in the situation are getting the services they need. So this is a way, everything that I just showed you in that map is now translated into this design, everything that I collected from the coalition. And so what I've been doing is trying to create a system that would not only allow digital touch points, but that these digital points, touch points would then help facilitate services to victims of human trafficking. So this is the first prototype, and we're actually just starting to develop this prototype, and we're going to start doing tests with service agencies in Texas and North Carolina and Florida. And um, it would basically be a service-side um, database that would allow agencies to decide what information they want to share outside of their own agency. Um, let's say if they have a particular person they want to help provide services to. I, let's say I can only provide one service and Judy can provide another, then I need to make sure I can get her that information in a safe and secure way. And this would allow them to do that. But it also allows them to keep, keep accurate data, not just historical, but current. And that's what's really important here. Um, one of the things that I think would be really important is allowing trends. So it's blank right now because I don't have any images that I can use here. And um, I'm really particular about the images that I use for human trafficking. And so I, I don't put any in my, in my presentations. But this would allow um, artificial or machine learning to then look through those images and draw on similarities and to help find cases that belong together because often with victims of human trafficking, there's more than one name involved with the same person. And so it can help draw us either to routes or to, um, to help provide um, uh, law, or law enforcement and lawyers with the information they need to actually convict someone of, of trafficking, because that is very difficult. And this is a page that would speak to the victim themselves. Um, so. This was actually with the School of Social Work. So I ran, <laughs> I ran a workshop. I run a workshop with undergraduate and graduate students and with the School of Social Work. Um, and I really do that so that way I can speak to one of the limitations. And I love to hear other people's ideas of how do you educate these populations on human trafficking. And so um, one of the things that I've done is I've created personas based off of all of the research that I've done that allows me to go into organizations and work with, with students in some capacity on how can I get them to see how their design decisions help create design solutions and how can they, we can then re, reimagine um, design solutions and how we can educate people on human trafficking. So this is empathy mapping um, and then just drawing on ideas. And, and this was not planned. This was a, another workshop I did in an inter international location and their the whole concept map was based off of social workers, but I think it's very telling of the power of what you guys do. And then their ideas of how we could then educate certain, certain populations. And that's it. So thank you. <laughs> Does anyone have questions? Yeah. It is free. I did not say that, but I appreciate you asking. Yes. Um, well, I was really lucky. Um, I hate using that word because lucky it, it means it just fell into my lap. But it was a lot of hard work. <laughs> um, I I did NPR interviews. I there's a, a truck driving radio station called the Mad Dog Trucks um, Truck Show. I'm going to get that a little bit wrong. It's on Sirius Radio, and they invited me on to talk for an hour. And that was really important. And I noticed that every time I did a talk somewhere or I was invited onto a talk show like that, that the, the app would skyrocket. And then we would receive um, suspected cases. I was also really lucky to have NBC, the DFW um, NBC station, do um, two nights of coverage on Operation Compass. And that just, all of our numbers went up, way up. So it really was correlated to me like going out and talking to people. Um, and so one of the downsides is I'm no longer in Texas, and so I don't really do as much 
um, events as, as, or even you know, educational platforms as I did when I was there. So there has been a, de a decrease, but what I'm trying to do now is change it so that there's a framework. So, um, and this still speaks to what your question was, because um, the framework I'm hoping will allow like a coalition to take on the Operation Compass framework and then still educate and how, allow it to be disseminated. Because that is, that is an issue. Do you have a question? Sure. Um, I have a question about information sharing yes. and use of your app. I'm curious if the agencies have struggled with privacy concerns or some of the privacy concerns. Mm -hmm. So with my app, um, the person that receives all of the suspected cases is their person who's in charge of collecting all of their hotline. And so from there, they decide how to handle that suspected case based off of the same way if they were to receive it through their hotline or in another format. Um, so there hasn't been any current concerns in that respect, but I do think there could be potential concerns that we need to address once the database is created. And so actually, the University of Illinois has a database system that is HIPAA and FERPA compliant, and the Mayo Clinic uses it. And so my hope is that if it's good enough for the Mayo Clinic, it'll be good enough for this. But you know, we'll we'll see, and there's there's still some hoops we need to go through, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious about the partnership with Mosaic, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about um, how that works. I was unclear. Yeah. So you know, you receive referrals on the um, app, and mm -hmm. I was sort of um, curious, sort of what their role is, and if you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, exactly. I'm happy to. So. Um, so the way that I started working with them was, um, as I mentioned, Bill started working, or he's created the Freedom Network and with a co-partner. I don't remember her name, I apologize. Um, and so I went to the Freedom Network knowing he was in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and hoping that I would meet him. And so I did, I met him and he was like, oh, we should talk. And then it just sort of died, we never really connected. And so I decided to work as an intern at Mosaic Family Services. <laughs> And so, you know, I was like, I know, so I was like, how am I going to get in the door? And so I thought, I'll just go work as an intern. Like, they must need a graphic designer. And so I went in and I was, you know, I was probably like 38 at the time. And I was working as a, their intern and I just did all of their design needs. And so they were like, Lisa, what else? You know, and we would, you know, talk about what I was working on. And so then Bill was like, oh, we met at the Freedom Network. We should talk about it. And so from there, it just... He became very impassionate and very supportive of what I was doing. And so we started the partnership off. And then um, the woman who works with me, her name is Sulan, she's in charge of their shelter there. And um, so she's the one that received the suspected cases. Now, I don't know exactly what happens because I'm not allowed to know, which I'm fine with. But I do trust. It, it was very important to me that when we made the decision of how they would handle it, that law enforcement was also in agreement. So not only was it Mosaic and I sitting in the room, but the Dallas PD was sitting in the room. And so our concern, which I think was a fair concern, was if I say that this information is gonna go directly to law enforcement, that we wouldn't receive any suspected cases. So it was very intentional that we decided the information would go to Mosaic, and that if need be, if they didn't, if this was a new case that they weren't already aware of, they would bring in Sergeant Nunez and then at that point, they would all decide together how they would move forward with it. So they investigate the allegations? Okay. They do, yes. And so that's one thing I would often tell the truck drivers or the plumbers or the restaurant inspectors that we were speaking to is if you're unsure, report it because we have amazing people who can look at it with knowledgeable eyes and identify what's happening. Yeah, yeah of course. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate you all being here. <laughs>